Okay, so we haven't talked about China in, in a very long time since um, the debates about European imperialism in East Asia and the movements toward Chinese revolutions to overthrow their domestic leadership, their emperor type of system, uh, because it was so dominated by Europeans that it tended to anger a whole lot of Chinese people. So he had systematic revolutions that broke out from about the year 1900 into the 1920s and 30s. Um, those systematic revolutions didn't very much solve much. Uh, they established new types of governments that, you know, some of them are more democratic than others. Uh, so every once in a while, monarchy comes back. Um, but all those governments are pretty unstable into the 1920s. And in 1931, there's China and the world again. Uh, another problem hit China, and that was basically the beginning of World War II between Japan and China. Japan invaded northern China, a place called Manchuria, and occupied it and colonized it and uh, created massive amounts of uh, social pain amongst the native kind of northern Chinese. Um, it was an extraordinarily brutal occupation. So China and Japan were very much locked in a uh, real war against each other for quite a few years until about 1945. So uh, World War II in East Asia takes up a whole lot more time than uh, what we see as World War II in Europe. So uh, seven or eight more years. So World War II in East Asia began before Hitler even came to power in Germany. So it's a, a much longer and, in a lot of ways, bloodier history. But to skip through the, the massively gory details, uh, we'll go right to 1945 when the United States has intervened and has taken on Japan also and uh, ends the war against Japan by dropping a couple of atomic bombs that did their own massive damage. So World War II was suddenly ended in August, September of 1945, and the Japanese were forced to retreat from China and, and many other uh, the places that the Japanese had conquered in the Western Pacific. Um, Chinese leaders basically got their own country back, and very quickly they started fighting each other again in another civil war. So there was some kind of national unity that came together amongst the Chinese to fight off the foreign occupiers, which is uh, pretty normal stuff in world politics. And once that occupier was knocked out, they really went after each other again. Uh, the new Chinese Civil War basically broke down between one group that were pro-communists and another group that called themselves nationalists or were recognized in the West as being nationalists. So this is the beginning of the Cold War. and. Obviously, the United States supports any group that is anti-communist. So they support the nationalists. The U.S. government gives money and weapons to the nationalists until about late 1948 or so. It was very much uh, debated in the highest levels of U.S. foreign policy uh, whether these uh, Chinese nationalists were worthy of support. They were corrupt themselves and fairly untrustworthy for the U.S. or for the American taste or view. Um, so when the U.S. withdrew its support from the so-called nationalists, uh, they fell pretty quickly. And the war, the Chinese Civil War, has ended with a communist victory in August of 1949. The so-called nationalists flee the Chinese mainland and go to the island that is today known as Taiwan, so a small island, and they set up a different Chinese government. And they on that little island they claim to be the official Chinese government but uh, and would be recognized as the official Chinese government until by the US I think until like 1976 or 78 or something like that uh, but it's very obvious who's in control of mainland China there's really not much doubt about that at all Oops. okay so um, one of the major long-term problems of the Chinese Communist victory for U.S. foreign policy is that a lot of Americans are very afraid that this has happened. They see the growth of communism now into one of the world's largest populations. 
and there's a lot of accusations that the Truman administration, the Democratic administration, had, quote, lost China, as if China was like, owned by the U.S. to lose in the first place. Um, but Americans in general, the American population, American media, and even the American government, from really this point forward, will assume that any of these so-called post-colonial nationalist movements, where communist or socialist come to power either by revolution, by coup, which is knocking out a sitting government uh, through some kind of violent uprising, um, or even by voting. Um, that whenever socialists or communists come to power, the, the Americans will immediately assume that they want to sign an alliance with the Soviets. And that's where the Americans take the foreign policy stance to stop the spread of communism anywhere in the world. So China is one of the big uh, kind of beginners of that U.S. foreign policy. And obviously that's why uh, the U.S. won't rec formally recognize uh, the communist domination of China for about 30 years, give or take. Uh, the major communist leader and who became basically the Stalin of China is named Mao Zedong. And that's a picture of him about 10 years later or so. Um, Mao becomes literally uh, viewed in China and is viewed in China today as basically uh, the Chinese Karl Marx. And if you ask a lot of people in China today, they don't even know who Karl Marx is. They think that Mao came up with all those ideas that we've already talked about. Uh, complaints about industrialization, capitalism and exploitation of workers and whatnot. So Mao is the great kind of national communist leader. So questions about any of this so far? Okay. Um, basically all of Mao's major policies for China are very reminiscent of especially Stalin's policies in the 1920s, 30s, up until the beginnings of World War II in Europe. Um, Mao's policies are ideological. They are utopian. Um, they are dreaming of creating this perfect classless society. And even the steps that Mao's government begins to take to implement that are very reminiscent of Stalinism. Uh, basically, Mao wanted to industrialize China as fast as possible, just like Stalin. Uh, recognized that communism is not very much viewed favorably in the West and that any communist country is very likely to be attacked by the West to knock out those governments if or unless those governments built up enough military power to defend themselves. So Mao, like Stalin, believed that the first step in that is to build a bunch of factories that would be able to churn out tanks and planes and bombs and all the things of national defense. So the first idea is to implement crash industrialization, just like the Soviet Union had experienced largely in the 30s and 40s. Basically trying to take Europe's entire industrial revolution, which took, give or take, 100 years, and try to accomplish that in China in maybe five or 10 years. It's a very powerful government move, and it's a unified, rigid government decision that is enforced throughout the population. The major problem of crash industrialization though, especially for poorer countries like China or the Soviet Union when they try it, when they start to try it, is that they tend to not have a whole lot of money to pay for the outside expertise to give advice on how to build factories and to you know, buy the resources and all this kind of stuff. So they have to find something to sell internationally to build up enough money to start the process of building up industrialization. And Mao hit on basically the exact same idea that Stalin had hit on, which is to have the government take over all the farms in the whole country so that all the farming crops, all the harvest produced in the whole country would be government property. Therefore, the government could export that food throughout the world, sell it, and that's how they get the money. So this is known generally as the collectivization of farming or agriculture. Mao even went a little bit further by... Uh, nationalizing or collectivizing all commerce, uh, most industry that, or the little industry that existed in China to that point. And the uh, exact same result happened in China, it's happened in the Soviet Union and places that the Soviets dominated. A lot of those small time farmers didn't want to give their land to the government. A lot of these farmers have lived on that land for maybe hundreds of years, 
they viewed it as a kind of ancestral home, a piece of their family's pride, and many of them resisted. And just like with Stalin, those who resist are wiped out, either through the military coming through and killing people, or maybe Mao just doesn't allow enough food into that area of the country and just starve the people out. So millions of people are killed one way or another through this collectivization. And uh, once that is seen to be fully implemented by the mid-50s, they start what he calls the Great Leap Forward, which is take that money and start building factories as fast as possible. So that starts in 1958. And predictably, just like in the Soviet Union, it didn't work very well. Um, Karl Marx had basically said that um, he didn't want the communist revolution to hit in these backwards kind of agrarian 1700 style economies. Marx wanted the revolutions to hit in places like Britain or Germany or France because they, are, they would already have enough factories to make all the clothes and you know, stuff that people need in society. So it wouldn't be a kind of massive change, at least production wise. But the Soviets and the Chinese under these dictators try to implement it um, and it fails in a lot of instances. And of course, a lot of these types of dictators, just like dictators today, when there's some kind of government failure, um, don't want to take responsibility themselves, right? Because they believe that they have the great solution. So they're very unwilling to take criticism. And anyone below them who criticizes the government, even government officials, if they criticize their superiors, are knocked out. Uh, they disappear, they're put on trial, some are just executed, some are put into forced labor camps, some are exiled from the country. Uh, so there's a general wave of political purges against anyone who complains. Um, Mao was already getting to be pretty old by the early 60s and actually went into a political retirement in about 1962-63, decided that he had given his contribution to the Chinese people, left government, and went off to kind of live out his days. Um, the people who really took control from him when he left uh, don't seem very good at running this crash industrialization, China starts undergoing major problems, so Mao decides to make a comeback in 1966. Um, Mao basically says that the people who took control in China were corrupt or inept or you know, whatever's going on, they're not doing the job correctly, so Mao tells the people he has to come back and finally solve the major catastrophe. Uh, of course he doesn't blame himself for starting the ball rolling toward this catastrophe. But at this point, Mao needs some kind of massive popular support to get back into power. Um, the people who feared him returning, and they had, uh, they were very justified in fearing his return because he is a murderous dictator. Um, they don't want to let him back in. So Mao has to get some kind of popular support to justify his push back into power. So he goes to, and not just the Chinese people, but he gives speeches that are broadcast and uh, written down and whatnot, where he basically says that the reason that industrialization is failing so far in China is because there are capitalist terrorist spies still secretly operating in China, and that they are bombing factories and they are uh, basically throwing a monkey wrench in the works in order to slow down the process, in order to get the Chinese government to fail so that communism fails and China would go back to capitalism, or some kind of capitalism. Does that make sense? So he doesn't take the blame himself. He blames the kind of closet capitalists throughout China for trying to destroy his great vision. And he says that he's going back into power to wipe them out. And he calls on the Chinese people, and largely the younger generation, to literally wipe out anyone that they thought might be a capitalist spy. So in China, in a, starting about 1966, in what he calls the Cultural Revolution, you tend to get these kind of roving bands of teenagers that get together in towns and villages, and anyone they believe might be a capitalist, they kill. And Mao is literally calling on the younger generation, the so-called like pure and moral generation, to rise up and take out all of the greed from society, violently. So this isn't even supported often by the official Chinese army. This becomes uh, basically anarchy. And in these kinds of days, you can get away with uh, killing really anyone you didn't like and maybe get away with it because so many people are dying. 
know, there's not much investigation. It's not like these teenagers are doing background checks and looking for evidence and holding trials or anything, right? They're going into people's houses in the middle of the night and they're killing people. And this happens all over China. And we don't have very precise numbers on how many people died, but it's in the millions. And you combine that sense of social anarchy and fear with the fact that China's economy is also failing pretty badly to the point where uh, the Chinese harvest is failing and uh, the Chinese government can't raise enough food for its own population. So you also get massive famines that hit for about 10 years starting in 1966, right when Mao goes back into power. And uh, some several millions of people who died in the Cultural Revolution didn't die because they were killed. They died because they didn't have food. And we have stories from all over China of uh, families literally eating grass in order to survive because there's just not enough food to eat. So questions about any of those? It's a, an extraordinarily horrible time to be in China. Um, with Mao at the, the top of the government again and issuing these orders, again, anyone who questions what he is doing is basically gotten rid of. Just like with Stalin or Hitler or anyone like that. Um, therefore, Mao stays in power literally till the day he dies. Because no one is willing to challenge him. And Mao's government is only altered on his death. And when he died, the major leaders made the decision to uh, take out his biggest followers and then rebuild the government from within, within the party, the Chinese Communist Party, which is what the CCP stands for. So Mao is out in 76. And just like in the Soviet Union, it takes a few years for the next group of leaders to consolidate power at the highest level of the party. Remember, this is not a democracy, this is a dictatorship. So the highest levels of the dictatorship, those members get together and basically choose who's going to be in charge next. So it takes a couple years for eventually Deng Xiaoping to consolidate power to a point where he can make decisions and have those decisions uh, reliably enforced throughout uh, the government. Um, Deng Xiaoping is an interesting person. Uh, he is, or was, a, a person who very much questioned Mao. Uh, Deng Xiaoping was not so much ideolog ideologically driven. He didn't talk about building this great utopian society. Uh, Deng Xiaoping is more an objective economic type of thinker. He wants to pursue policies that will get economic growth for the long term for China and his policies will, in many ways, be much, much more successful. So, uh, one of the very first things that uh, Deng does once he gets to this uh, pinnacle of power and he becomes the kind of head policymaker for China, he officially renounces the ideological underpinnings of the government. He basically says, we're going to get rid of all this uh, philosophical stuff and instead we're going to do real economic reforms to try to figure out how to get economic growth for the long term. So he wants scientific studies of economics, what are the shortcomings of um, Chinese industry, how do you fix those problems, and he starts to implement them. And he implements uh, several major reforms. And the interesting one of the interesting things about Deng Xiaoping's rule, or his reign for about 10 years in China, is uh, he starts moving toward capitalism. So Deng seemed to realize that when you have national government control over every single factory, in every single industry, in every piece of the economy, economic growth is very slow because government bureaucracies are fairly rigid. Right. If you're a middle-level bureaucrat, those people tend not to take risks. Because if you're a bureaucrat, um, your decision to take a risk is basically based on what are the potential outcomes. If you're already in the government um, and things are not operating very well, 
You can either sit in your office fairly quietly and just continue to operate the system as it is and therefore take no risk to yourself. Or you could propose changes, which if those changes are actually implemented, um, if they go badly, you get blamed and you get knocked out. If they go well, you can be promoted. But, you know, a lot of careful and cautious people that are very wary of protecting their position just don't want to take those kinds of risks. And Dung understood that. So he starts to decentralize economic decision making in China. He started setting up, or the party under his leadership started setting up more regional controls and even city level uh, economic managers to do some amount of experimentation to figure out better ways of functioning. Um, so uh, Deng wants to allow a lot of the economy to operate on the lower levels, the more local levels, rather than every single thing being dictated from the central capital. And that is what Deng understood the mistake of the Soviet Union was, that every single piece of the economy is directed from Moscow. And therefore they had a stagnant economy for several decades, even by the late 70s. And one of the interesting things about this is that uh, this kind of reform starts looking more like the capitalist West, who talk about more economic freedom. If you allow competition among several regions or companies, then the company that does best would get the most profit, get the most growth, and therefore you can very easily come to understand which system is most efficient. Um, Dung also put uh, profit motive incentives into certain important aspects or several small industries within China itself, the ones he wanted to see, usually the, the largest economic growth. So he is also, even before Mikhail Gorbachev comes to power in the Soviet Union, implementing Gorbachev's type of program to push fast economic growth. So if in, in one side of China you have uh, you know, industries completely run by government with no profit motive, therefore the government employees running the factories are not inspired to work very hard because you know, can you know, really work hard all year long and still you're a government employee so you get the same salary as before. Or in another region, if you work real hard, you can get some kind of profit sharing. Therefore, you get more money. I mean, which person is motivated to work hard? The person who's going to get more money because they have something to gain. So uh, he also implements that by putting it in very strategic places of the economy at first, and then of course it'll grow from there. Uh, another thing that Dung openly advertised for was what we call foreign direct investment, which basically means that Dung allowed China to be open to foreign companies, to build factories in China, to have more employment, more industry. So he didn't just want to rely on government building things itself. He wanted to rely on also capitalists from throughout the world who think they can make money in the Chinese market or through Chinese labor uh, to build things in China and the more things get built the more economic growth you get. That's his uh, basic formula. So China under the communist leader Deng Xiaoping uh, starts making a transition to what we would basically recognize as very capitalistic types of systems. And that's an important thing to understand especially in relation to the Soviet Union. So economic growth starts very fast under Deng Xiaoping, especially by the mid-80s. Uh, how are they growing? Another of Deng's uh, major policy proposals was to basically make simple factories at first, factories that can churn out plastic goods, what he called light manufacturing. So he doesn't want to build the planes and tanks and bombs, you know, the big coal and steel kinds of industries at first. He said it's easier to build simpler factories that can churn out a lot of easily made products for export all over the world. And his basic formula is if we can make a lot of that cheap stuff quickly, we can export it all over the world, get a lot of money from the rest of the world, and once we get that money over time built up, then we can make the transition into higher technologies or heavier industries. So in the early to mid 80s, uh, people throughout the world started to notice that whenever they bought something made out of plastic or some you know, little cheap type of thing, it tended to say made in China on the bottom. 
because they were the ones doing it. And they flooded the world market with all these uh, types of goods. And this was a, a government program. And it was very successful. They made a lot of money, and later on in the 90s, they will make that transition into higher levels of technology. Uh, the Chinese economy starts growing very fast, so many of these things are successful, but with any you know, very fast economic growth, you also get major internal problems. Uh, number one is inflation. The value of their currency uh, starts to get pretty shaky, and that is an uh, outrage amongst many Chinese people. Um, remember when we talked about Germany, when you get high inflation and people's wages don't grow at that same level, uh, people have great fear of you know, basically having enough money to eat. So that's a major outcry in China throughout the 80s. Uh, there's also um, banking scandals and even bank failures. There's accusations of government corruption. Uh, the leaders of the government are supposed to be basic civil servants who are only supposed to make base, like a middle class type of living. They're not supposed to be paid millions and millions of dollars. Uh, even today, the major leaders of China, theoretically, even all the way up to the president and the premier, only supposed to make like forty or fifty thousand dollars, you know, converted to U.S. dollars. Um, but even recently, it's been revealed that uh, the president who is outgoing, his family is worth something like three billion dollars. Well, how does that happen? Um, it's through basic corruption. Big companies give government officials big payoffs to allow their companies to do certain things. So in a lot of ways, just like today, uh, members in the U.S. Congress or the President, uh, they don't get big salaries usually, 100, 150,000 a year, which seems pretty big to people at our level, uh, but they're millionaires. And most of them are millionaires even before they go into office, so you know, something is happening. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, mass migration, another major problem for this level of economic growth is because it's so focused on exports. Uh, most of the factories are built along the seacoast, the Pacific Ocean coastline, because that's the easiest place to ship things throughout to the rest of the world. Uh, so you start getting factories popping up like crazy along the coastline, but not so much internally because it's more expensive to move things by road or train. So you start getting large cities popping up along the coastline and uh, a lot of people from the internal areas, from the farmland, start leaving those areas and going toward the mass cities in you know, huge ways of migration. So the Chinese economic and population growth in the early 80s started to get very skewed toward the giant cities along the coastline and the internal cities, uh, the, basically the countryside types of areas, start losing population. And that's been a problem really ever since. Does that sound familiar to you? Yeah, the same thing is happening in the United States right now. People are leaving the internal kind of agricultural areas and going into the cities. Because that's where the jobs are, or the highest paying jobs usually. So a lot of these problems uh, start leading to outcries for democracy. Uh, there's several kind of famous Chinese complaints, artists and whatnot. And the major question that seems to face Xiaoping's government and by the mid to late 80s, is uh, a real conundrum that it still faces largely today. Uh, the Chinese government seems completely dedicated to promoting economic growth. In order to get economic growth, you generally need to have people buying and selling things and the freedom to invest and try to make money. So usually economic growth tends to lead to more social and political freedoms, right? But this is a rigid dictatorship that doesn't like to give out many social and political freedoms. So there's a great question if this level of economic growth will inspire the Chinese people or motivate them to do something about that dictatorship to finally kind of achieve the aspirations of freedom that economic prosperity tends to bring. So is the Chinese government going to continue uh, allowing more openness and being more permissive of what people can say and do in public? Or will it clamp down and take the risk of slowing down economic growth? And that question was asked in the 80s, and it's largely still being asked today. So questions about Deng Xiaoping. Uh, he is hugely important in Chinese history because he represents the major shift from these civil wars 
and utopian ideas to a more kind of economic scientific analysis. Okay. All right. Um, in early 1989, a popular politician who gave voice to, or you know, gave some kind of voice to a lot of these complaints, uh, as much probably more than any other politician, uh, he actually died, and a state funeral was held for him. So this is a giant kind of government funeral service. Um, and this politician was so popular that people flood into a place called Tiananmen Square, which is like the big government open space where people have these uh, big kind of government functions. Um, and people go to this funeral to pay their respects to a politician that they largely view as you know, voicing their interests. Um, and then they stay even after the funeral processions are over. And this grows into a large protest against the dictatorship and against the Communist Party. And uh, their public demands grow to be greater freedoms and possible democracy in China. So there are rumors of this could be the beginning of the end of the Chinese government as people know it. This may be the people rising up in China to take down their dictatorship just as would happen throughout the rest of 1989 in Eastern Europe and even the Soviet Union itself. So this is seen as possibly one more instance of these dictatorships being challenged by their own people and possibly being taken down from within. Um, Deng Xiaoping and his leadership were having none of that. So in late May they ordered uh, the capital city to be placed under martial law, which basically means uh, the police forces and the army are going to take over, establish a curfew, and uh, you know your, whatever rights you hold as citizens or as people are basically going to go out the window. Uh, when the people still refuse to leave, the government sent in the troops on uh, around midnight on the night of June 4th, or June 3rd, going into the 4th, the morning of the 4th. And uh, they start machine gunning the people who refuse to leave, literally. They march out the troops and they start just shooting into the crowd. So the crowd looks to leave Tiananmen Square as fast as they can. Many of them are trapped and they are slaughtered. And uh, people watch this on live TV throughout the world. Because you know, ABC News and whatnot were there with cameras. And possibly the most famous image of this giant government crackdown in Beijing occurred uh, in the daytime in China when a uh, guy who looked to be just kind of shopping was walking down or across the street, one of the main streets, and I believe it was Beijing, when the line of government tanks started rolling down the street to implement the crackdown. And uh, he stood in the middle of the street and basically dared them to run him over. And again, this is broadcast live throughout the world. And uh, people sat on their couches and, or wherever they were and uh, watched this guy in the street and we expected him to be run over. And this is a dictatorship and you know, what happens to the, tank, to the tank driver who actually stops? What's the government going to do to the tank driver? Who knows? So this became a kind of symbolic pinnacle of the people rising up and uh, the state using overwhelming force to crush them. The government officially announced that only about two or three hundred deaths occurred in the crackdown. Uh, the lowball estimates internationally amongst international observers and humanitarian groups and whatnot are at least a couple thousand, but most likely much higher. But the Chinese government, the Communist Party in control, does survive 1989 and largely seems to survive because they implemented the same kind of uh, Brezhnev doctrine that the Soviets had used for decades, which in 1989, Gorbachev and the Soviets stopped. They didn't march out the soldiers to kill their own people. The Chinese do, and they survive. Um, Deng Xiaoping, though, becomes uh, questioned and unpopular in a lot of ways in China as a direct result of this crackdown, so he announces his retirement fairly quickly afterward. So, questions about this at all?
Alrighty. Uh, when Deng announces his retirement, again, there's going to be a leadership change, and again, it takes kind of a few years to, uh, for the people at the highest levels to consolidate power to the point where one group can claim to be the leadership. It happens by 1992 with the uh, so-called election amongst the you know, high 50 or so, 100 or so party leaders of the former mayor of Beijing, Zheng Zemin. So there's a big gathering, uh, the 1992 Party Congress uh, formally gives Zemin power. And Zhang says that uh, the new rule in China will be that the leadership will be in power for 10 years and then they will be replaced. So they are replaced uh, so far every 10 years. So you're going to get a new group in 2002 and a new group being chosen in 2012. Uh, in his speech, Zhang also announced uh, the transition to what he called more of a market-based economy, or market-oriented economy, uh, which again is an interesting statement in light of the fact that this is supposed to be a communist economy. So in the 1990s, it will transition even more heavily toward capitalism. Uh, Zhang really centralizes power under his own leadership by taking three different offices at the same time. The leadership of the state, the leadership which is the government, the official administration, the leadership of the party, the political party that is theoretically elected um, or chosen by the people somehow. And also he is the head of the military. So he combines three of these offices all in, in himself, which was controversial. Uh, Deng Xiaoping had advised all the way back in nineteen late 70s that you know, that's not really an acceptable thing to do is too much power for one person but Shang did it um, okay other things that will happen in the 90s under his leadership um, so the, the market oriented reforms are growing and growing uh, the problem with that is that once you encourage more and more kind of foreign investment and capitalism in the country, the so-called state-owned enterprises, the government-run industries, are inefficient and backwards in comparison. They're so inefficient that the government has to spend more money in running them than they actually make in revenue. So these are a, basically a slap in the face to uh, the usefulness or the efficiency of communism running entire industries or even its own smaller level companies. So one of the long-term problems of these state-owned enterprises, and many of them are still around, is that they're basically a, a drain on the government budget. They're sucking up money because they're so inefficient. And you would think any objective government would say uh, something that is using that much money that was created to make money is such a problem that the government should just cut it off and get rid of it. Um, but there's theory of, you know, if you get rid of all of them, then you're not a communist economy at all. Uh, the continuing disproportionate growth population and economic-wise of the east over the west, the east coastline over the western inland countryside agricultural type of areas. Um, there is a lot of debt going on in China, not just amongst the average people, but amongst large companies also. And uh, China, every once in a while, will experience some bank failures in the 90s. They generally, they'll avoid the major economic catastrophe uh, known as the Asian flu that, uh, that basically swallowed a huge amount of East Asian economies in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. Uh, they also start experiencing crop failures, especially in uh, their own country in, in uh, agricultural sections in the West to the point where they start have they have to start importing food from outside of China, which is always a giant kind of slap in the face to uh, nationalists and communists who say oh, we can run our country ourselves, we don't need any outside help, then they can't grow enough food to feed their own people. Uh, that also happened in the Soviet Union by the 1970s. And again, a lot of these leaders of government are corrupt. 
and uh, many people know it. They're afraid to say so publicly because when you complain about these things publicly, the government may come and do away with you. So just like complain, complaining about the king, when you're living in that country that's ruled by the king, you take your risks. So those same kinds of political repression were ongoing. And again, the major conundrum is that the party, the Communist Party, largely stays in power because it promises to deliver economic growth to the people. And when China's economic growth starts to rely more and more on market orientation, which means bringing more capitalism in, uh, you start to get the major questions. Is China a communist economy anymore? And by the mid to late 90s, China starts making the transition from the so-called light manufacturing of the early 80s to the high technology. And that's where China is largely focused today. Um, they don't make so much the plastics and whatnot anymore. They make computers, they make robotics, and they're starting, or they've already surpassed even the United States in making solar panels. So the highest technology that could lead to the kind of next definition of what the world economy would look like in the 21st century. They are investing very, very heavily in that stuff. And again, because this is a dictatorship, it's a, you know, the government can spend money and make these investments wherever it wants without usually the fear of mass public uprisings or mass public questioning or popular oversight or anything like that. You know, in the United States, when the U.S. government decides to spend money in a different way and make a transition, uh, those politicians have to go for re-election. So there can be a mass public backlash that has often convinced American politicians to not make those transitions. But the Chinese leadership doesn't really worry about that very much. They can make their decision then and force it militarily if they have to. Here's a kind of simplified map of the major population problem is that the major cities are all pretty much located along the coastline and they're growing like crazy population wise and uh, many of the internal regions are losing population because people are literally migrating to the cities. And of course uh, the foreigners largely only invest in the cities that are growing because that's where you can make the most money. So you don't get a lot of foreign direct investment into places that are losing population. <coughs> that's not where the economic growth is. Okay, uh, by the late 90s, the biggest debate uh, seemingly within China, and it's very difficult to understand what the internal debates are amongst the Chinese leadership. So a lot of this is obviously just based on um, public statements they've made and then the long-term results. So we can connect you know, policy statements to what they actually did. Uh, but it's very difficult to link that in kind of real time. Like the Chinese leaders, when they say something today, it's very difficult to know if they're really going to do it until you know, a few years later you can look at the results. So one of the big things that uh, seemed to have been debated within the highest levels of the Chinese government was whether or not to join the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Probably the, the this debate had, and this move to join the WTO has major uh, consequences on either side, benefits and costs. So probably the biggest be benefit is that if you join the WTO, which is basically a worldwide investment kind of uh, stabilization body, or at least it sees itself that way. Um, if China joined the WTO, that would seem to open China to a whole lot more investors throughout the world, so they would possibly invest in China and push its economic growth even further. So some motivations to join it. Um, the Chinese leadership by the mid to late 90s, uh, their economy is growing so fast that they recognize that they are on the cusp of real world power. Um, as we've seen throughout the semester, 
political and military power is based on economic strength and economic growth. From Spain, when we way back when started the semester, to France in the 1600s, Britain in the 1700s, Britain and Germany and France and the U.S. in the 1800s, and largely the U.S. ever since. Um, economic growth and power, economic wealth, gives certain areas political power. And the Chinese government understood that it was on the cusp of achieving some level of world power, so they seemed to want some kind of influence in the international body that makes economic decisions and trade decisions. So if the WTO is going to, make, to be making worldwide economic decisions, then as China is a rising economy and rising power, they want to see it at that table. So that's one of the motivations. Another is to, um, really, if China is growing into a world power and they don't join the WTO, then the WTO can make decisions against China. So that's another reason they really want to see it at that table. Uh, they see it as the ability to protect what they want and protect themselves against a, a large international body for making decisions against them. And there's also the idea, if China joins this large and uh, powerful economic group throughout the world, then they get a certain amount of uh, recognition throughout the world as a rising power. And that's something that rising powers all, often want. Another thing is that uh, you know, a lot of things, if China was to join the WTO, the WTO would make demands on certain changes within China. And a lot of times, these are changes that the Chinese government uh, sometimes wanted to make, but were very controversial within the government. There were people that were against those kinds of changes. So a lot of the pro-change, pro-reform oriented types of Chinese politicians say it would be good to join the WTO because then they're going to force us to do it. So we can do what we want and we won't take the blame. Does that make sense? It gives them political cover. And if you join the WTO, that could further open up major world markets to Chinese exports. So by joining this large international body, once you become a full member, then basically your country is open to their exports and their countries are open to yours. So this could uh, gain a lot of areas in the world that Chinese exports hadn't really gotten to yet. And that could promote the long-term economic growth for China also. So there's a lot of good things, potentially, for the Chinese leadership in joining the WTO. And these are you know, very big uh, ideas that will heavily impact the kind of world balance of power. So questions about any of these? And I know a lot of this starts to get pretty theoretical. All right, ready for the downside? All right. Downside is um, if you join the WTO, uh, the government just can't you know, shut down any company at once in the whole country anymore. There are rules against that under the WTO. And if, uh, if the government decided, if the Chinese government decided they wanted to go after a certain company within China and basically shut them down, or jail certain foreign investors, or confiscate their property somehow. If you're a member of the WTO, that's uh, going to be resisted by the other members. So the WTO often looks to defend the rights of investors in foreign countries. So if you're an American investor and you own a factory in China, um, the Chinese politicians may want to shut you down and take control of your factory. If they're a member of the WTO, the rest of the world may rise up against that decision and threaten China. So the ability of the government to control um, its investors and punish them for getting out of line will be lessened. 
And uh, another thing is that if you join the WTO, the, the world is going to demand, and the world investors are going to demand that China draw out, I mean, real reliable property ownership laws so that if something happens legally within China, uh, investors would have the ability to go to court in China to uh, defend their property or get some kind of reimbursement for you know, damages or uh, confiscations or something like this. And again, that lessens the Chinese government's power to inflict control and inflict punishment on uh, groups or companies that was you know, theoretically breaking the rules within China or breaking the rules of what the Communist Party wants. So that's a major drawback. And if they join the WTO and they start getting a lot of imports and their export markets grow so they export more, that is likely to only reinforce the disproportionate economic and population growth in the East because these foreign investors are going to pour even more into the eastern coastal cities and they're not going to invest in the western areas. So this could only uh, quicken the disproportionate growth, which uh, by the early 2000s is growing to uh, an epidemic, really. And you have massively overpopulated cities in eastern China and uh, population uh, shrinkage in the West to the point where they start having trouble uh, getting enough farmers to grow food in the West. And another major problem for China is that, and we've seen this throughout the semester also, uh, within governments, governments are usually run by the rich, and we've seen that repeatedly. Uh, joining the WTO could build a new class of wealth in China. You can get foreign investors, you can get technology investors, you can get entrepreneurs in China, even Chinese entrepreneurs. And if they rise to wealth, they may demand political power also. These people may not be very high level members of the, of the Communist Party that runs the country. So what happens when you have one party based, or one group running the country and he has the rise of, to wealth and prominence and uh, economic power of a new group that is excluded from the government? You could get a rivalry. So that could be very dangerous for the long-term ability of the party to literally uh, run the country the way they see fit. Uh, just like we saw when we talked about Europe's economic growth, um, Europe used to be run completely by the landowners. And then they you know, discovered all these other oceans and places they can go, and then the merchants started getting rich. right? The people buying and selling things all over the world. And they demanded political power from the kings. They demanded a voice in government. And then when the Industrial Revolution hit, and the factory owners started making all the money. They started taking over governments in the 1800s. So whenever you get a new class of wealth, a new source of wealth in a society, you can often get a direct political conflict because those rich people want a say in what the government does. And if they aren't let in, you could get uh, uh, you know, the threat of major civil conflict amongst the elite. Questions about any of these? Are you alive? <laughs> okay, so that's with the WTO. Um, Zheng Semin retired, and the group that had been running the place in the 90s for the most part retired in 2002, and a new leadership was chosen. Um, the problem with the new leadership is that they were basically uh, the next, the younger generation. And uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of these guys were fairly unknown by this point. Uh, they hadn't been at the highest levels of power yet, so uh, these guys were somewhat unpredictable in a lot of ways. Uh, this becomes known as the Who Win Administration. And they start uh, taking steps, especially to try to, if not eliminate, at least balance out the population in the East and West. And they start running government subsidies to farmers to pay farmers more so that a lot of people would be encouraged to move back to the West to get enough farmers to raise enough food so that society could function. So that was a major uh, policy implemented under the new administration in starting in 2002 or 2003 going forward. 
Um, one of the major problems, though, is that even this group is still corrupt now that they've gotten to the highest levels. And it's, uh, uh, let's see. I think it's uh, who that was, uh, his family is recently, I mean, literally just within the past few weeks, has been accused of being worth billions of dollars when this guy's literally supposed to be a kind of a middle manager kind of pay rate. So their government pay is not much, and it's you know, kind of average. Um, but somehow this family has accumulated, accumulated vast wealth. And there's open accusations that uh, the highest levels of the government are hugely corrupt, and they're stealing money for themselves and basically hiding it wherever they can. Uh, you get stories of uh, high-level administrators, like their kids are driving around in Ferraris and whatnot. And one of them even crashed a few weeks ago, and... You know, police investigation tried to cover up a lot of this stuff. Question. Yeah. Um, 2010, in 10 years, I mean, that would be right now. Yep. If, so are, are we still holding to that 10 year thing? Yes. That change of government? That just happened uh, two or three weeks ago, where, okay, where a party Congress met and a new president and a new, uh, what we call the Politburo, which is basically the highest, um, I think it's seven or eight guys in the whole government that represent the major industries and the major, major kind of political interests. Um, they are chosen, they will run the country. So yes, these two guys are leaving and their administrators are leaving. So we have a, a new president coming in named uh, Xi Jinping and he is uh, apparently going to be in control until 2022. So yeah, that's been uh, big news throughout the world um, over about the past month. So instead of having these kind of chaotic inheritance types of crises, uh, they try to systemize it now and make it predictable. Okay, uh, another problem of, especially in the 2000s, uh, the internet starts to grow by leaps and bounds. If you remember what the internet was in the late 90s, uh, it's very different today. Much more uh, kind of open source is the big catchphrase today. Uh, not so much in China, though, because the Chinese government understands that the more information that their people have access to, if they can watch movies and read political statements and uh, complaints from all over the world, uh, they could come to understand just how rigidly repressed they are politically. So uh, especially uh, cultural things and intellectual things in China are very heavily watched. And if you're in China, you just cannot access a whole lot of internet sites you get one of those kind of blocked messages. So even uh, U.S. companies like Google have been selling technology to the Chinese government to ensure that they cannot see things that the government doesn't want them to see and that the government is basically watching people on the Internet all the time. Uh, the government also controls cultural access. They control how much uh, music from the rest of the world gets in. Uh, which movies get in and they're sometimes heavily edited um, to make sure that there's no political messages in there. So there is a rigid information control. And on the 20th anniversary of Tiananmen Square in 2009, um, it was difficult for people to get into the square because the government feared that people would start coming together again on the 20th anniversary. So they had a uh, military and police everywhere watching people looking for cameras and whatnot. So information is still very heavily controlled as much as the government can possibly do it. And uh, today the Chinese government, or the Chinese economy is still growing very fast. Or through the 2000s it was growing very fast, about 9 to 10% a year, which is massive. Um, U.S. economists define 3% growth per year as being very healthy. And they, can, they consider 6 or 7% as nearing kind of out of control. So um, the Chinese government or the Chinese economy growing at 9 to 10% for about 15 years steadily is just massive, unthinkable economic growth. And uh, it's largely the result of, at first, a lot of the um, reforms implemented by Deng Xiaoping and continued and the transition that you see in the 90s, that's where you see the Chinese economy really taking off. 
Uh, there have been predictions over about the past four or five years uh, saying that the Chinese economy, with the U.S. government slowdown, eventual crash in 2007, 2008, that the Chinese economy would outgrow the U.S. economy somewhere around the year 2014 or so. Um, that appears to not be happening, at least at that pace, because the Chinese economy is slowing down, uh, going down to 6%, 4% growth over about the past year, year and a half. Uh, so those projections are not completely accurate today, but most economists throughout the world believe that the Chinese economy will outgrow the U.S. somewhere around 2020. And uh, that would be a major change. The U.S. has had the biggest economy in the world since World War I, so about 100 years. And if you notice, that's also when the U.S. rose to world power, right? The U.S. has largely been running the world in a lot of ways ever since, especially since 1945. So as President Obama constantly points out, um, economic strength and growth creates political power and military power in the world. So what happens if China outgrows the U.S.? You might have some um, competition throughout the world for resources and influence. Um, some other longer term estimates. So uh, you see that the estimates for U.S. economic growth, uh, what we call GDP, which is gross domestic product, this is probably estimated in trillions. So we're about 16, 17 trillion, not expected to grow very fast over the uh, 6, 30 years or so. But um, a few years ago, the Chinese economy was estimated to be growing. If it continued growing at the level it was in the late 2000s up until about 2010 or so, um, that if they continued that pace, it would vastly outgrow the U.S. But the problem with these long-term projections, you know, in the next 30 years, is that a lot happens in those 30 years, right? I mean, if you had looked at those kinds of projections in 1980, uh, it would be a vastly different you know, information set. So the problem is that usually this kind of consistent growth does not occur. Things happen. There's ups and downs. So uh, will it grow to that point in the next 30 years where China has well, an economy that's over twice the size of the U.S.? Uh, I would say probably not. That that's just too much time to make those kind of projections. But you know, that's one of the big popular fears, especially in the United States. That we're all going to be speaking Chinese in, in you know, 30 years or so and trading in Chinese money instead of US dollars. OK. Um, Chinese economic growth still seems dependent on foreign investment. And that is a long-term problem, even for Chinese Communist Party rule. Because the more foreign investment you get, the more foreign influence, uh, the more cultural ideas that could spread through China. And that could inspire people to do something. So you have a major dichotomy between what the party wants economically, growth, and what they want politically, which is control. Uh, how are they going to balance that? Can they balance that in the long term? That is one of the great questions for the Chinese government. And today, when you look at the incoming president who is going to take power, uh, or is in power, it's, it's fairly unclear at this point. Um, his big speech at the party congress was uh, largely a, a statement of, we will eliminate corruption. We have to eliminate corruption or else the party is going to die. So the Chinese government has a gigantic balancing act. They are very much walking a tightrope here, and they know it. So a lot of Western analysis, and especially American analysis, says that something is likely to happen in China politically. Uh, even today, there are an estimated 100 protests per day in China. So there's more permissiveness of people to speak out. What eventually happens to those people um, is uh, up for debate in a lot of times, or a lot of ways. Um, but a lot of Western analysts say something is likely to happen in China politically at some point. But that's pretty vague stuff. Something's going to happen at some point. 
They don't seem to know what that will be, when that will be, or how it will be. So uh, when a lot of foreign policy economists look at those kind of statements, they say, well, it looks like the U.S. government believes that something might happen, but it looks like it might be another 1989 with the Soviet Union where they're just completely surprised that it's happened. They have almost no contingency plans for what to do. But of course, the U.S. government doesn't really tell its people or the world very much about what its long-term plans are, right? I mean, in the presidential debates, did you hear the candidates talking about what to do about China in the long term? No. It's basically, we're going to take a tough stand. What does that mean? Silence. Or we're going to have more backbone or something like that. And one of the more interesting things about China recently is that just a few weeks ago, China made a big deal in Eastern Europe. Um, I think it was about three weeks ago, and about somewhere around, it was right around Thanksgiving. Um, a major international group met amongst what is called the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So largely a lot of these places in Southeast Asia and out, out into the islands in the Pacific had a regional conference. They invited Australia, India, China, and Japan also. And the United States, President Obama went there in person. And uh, the statements, the reports coming out are that Obama took an offer to these countries to form a trade alliance and they turned it down, an American-led trade alliance. They turned it down and then accepted a Chinese offer to do the same thing, but based with Chinese currency and excluding the United States completely. And when you consider that these countries combined hold over half the world's population and are estimated to be the source of economic growth for the world for the next 20 years or so. This is an important statement. Um, it could be that the Chinese government understands the long term and that these countries no longer trust uh, U.S. financial power or re economic reliability, to put it lightly. Um, and they are siding with what they believe will be the powerful country for the future. And if China um, can you know, lead this type of regional economy. Uh, they could see their economic growth shoot up even higher, and they could be a, a major center of world power going into the next few decades. Um, and one of the reasons that it's estimated, especially Southeast Asia, will have a lot of economic growth, is a lot of those light industries that make a lot of the cheap consumer goods that you say buy from Walmart or something like this, those factories are leaving China. And they're going to Cambodia, India, Vietnam, Bangladesh, because the Chinese workers are making so much money that now they have starting to get salary demands. And those companies don't like that, so they're going to the next poverty-ridden places of the world to hire the poorest and uh, least organized labor supplies. So um, in international markets, uh, big companies, industrialized companies, uh, look to move into the poorest regions of the world because they can pay those workers you know, 10 cents an hour or something like this, rather than an American worker, $20 an hour, or even a Chinese worker, $5 an hour. So even though uh, a few years ago, most of the Chinese population was living on a dollar a day in income, uh, they just seem to be getting priced out of their own markets when these companies start relocating even poorer places. But that seems to be, or at least argued by the economists, will be the source of economic growth for a lot of these regions and China is attaching itself to it and wants to lead it. So, what does that say about the long term? Who knows? We'll see. So questions about that at all? And this stuff is unreported in U.S. media, right? Has anyone even heard of this? Has anyone even heard that uh, Obama went to, what was it, Thailand? A few weeks ago? Right after the election? Yes, just a few weeks. Yeah. In an election where they're, the candidates are talking about, uh, we're going to go to like a currency war against China. And then they go to this and they get their butt kicked by Chinese uh, offers to other world regions. I mean, even if you launch that currency war, how successful is it going to be? 
So a lot of the stuff you saw in the debates was at best a joke. At worst, uh, inept politicians who don't know what the future holds or don't even have any estimates of what the future can hold.